today be talking about the upgrades updates to the Hawaii Pulse form. Dr. Daniel Fishberg is the medical director for the pain and palliative care department at Queens Medical Center in Honolulu. This is tremendously exciting. This is the world premiere of our new Hawaii State Pulse. And, and I, I want to share my appreciation, all the appreciations that Jeanette gave er, earlier to everyone. And, and also, there were a lot of eyeballs that we ran this by in draft form, the Pulse form. And, um, you know, different people across the health system, I too many to name, but it was really, really helpful. The biggest thing it helped us with is when there were questions, it said, we got to make it simpler. We got to make it simpler. So among the upgrades to the form, we really hope we made it a little simpler and a little easier to understand. My portion of the program is to, to sort of talk about the Pulse paradigm, remind us sort of Pulse 101, who's it for? What's it supposed to do? What are some of the challenges we run into? And then I'm going to just very quickly go through what the updates on the new form are so we can point them out for those of you who haven't spent the last last year uh, working on the form. So this it is, here it is, ta-da. Uh, this is your, the, the new Hawaii Pulse form. You, you just eyeball it. It may not look dramatically different to you, but I'll, I'll take some time to go through what some of the changes are. So just to remind you what the Pulse form is supposed to do, it, it really allows individuals to choose in advance medical treatments they want to receive and also identify those they do not want to receive. And critically, it's designed to provide direction for first responders during an acute illness. One of the biggest sources of confusion, I think, around POLST is the difference between the POLST and Advanced Healthcare Directive, and they are two very different things. Advanced Healthcare Directive, we recommend it for everybody who has capacity that's over 18. You know, obviously we know generally about a third of Americans do create a, an advanced healthcare directive, but generally the advanced directive is for everybody, all adults. The POLST is not. The POLST is really for a special population, generally the seriously ill, the medically frail. And of course, it, it, unfortunately, it, it can apply to pediatric uh, patients as well. Okay. The advanced healthcare directive is a very general document about your future treatment. Most people's directive says kind of the same thing that mine does. In the future, if I'm terminally ill with a short time to live, permanently unconscious, not expected to recover, or my doctors feel the burdens would exceed the benefits, then this is the philosophy of what I would want. And you check a box. Prolong life, focus on comfort, right? Very general, future-oriented, and it has to be triggered by something. That's not the POLST. The POLST are specific orders for current treatment. So I coined the term that the POLST, it's not your advanced directive, it's your now directive. And if you use that, you, you got to give me a nickel because I copyright it. So the POLST is your now directive. That's shorthand. Just to remind you, if, if you put comfort orders on it, comfort measures on it, it's, we're talking about now. It's not, it doesn't require a trigger like in the future, like an advanced healthcare directive. Okay. So very, very different, not future oriented, current. The advanced healthcare director appoints your healthcare agent. It's the only way officially to appoint a healthcare agent. And for people who have lost capacity, they can't create an advanced healthcare directive if it's a permanent loss of capacity, say in a dementing illness. Okay. But the pulse is not a way that you can assign an healthcare agent. Some people, we tried to fix that and clarify that on this version of the pulse, that it's, the pulse cannot be used to, to uh, appoint the agent, but it can be signed by the patient, the agent, or other legally authorized representatives, okay? So I hope that table provides some clarity between the difference between the two. So who, who, who could benefit from the POLST? Um, again, it's not for everybody. We tend to think about it for, for folks with chronic progressive illness, the medically frail, Perhaps maybe somebody who, who just strongly has, has a strongly held wish to avoid certain medical intensive treatments. Maybe they went through a really rough bout in the intensive care unit and they really thought about it and they, they're willing to go back to the hospital, but they don't want to be the intensive care unit, that kind of situation. And then the key one we often tell people to think about is uh, the surprise question. If you wouldn't be surprised if this patient died in the next year, um, some, that, that might be somebody that's worth having a good discussion about what their treatment preference would be, and then uh, possibly doing a POLST uh, to try to have those, those treatment preferences honored. Signing a POLST, there are some legal requirements. This is 
straight out of Hawaii Revised Statutes 327K, which was recently updated to include physician assistance. Um, so the polls has to be have two signatures on it. It's the patient or their legally authorized representative. So that could be their agent, could be their guardian, could be a surrogate. Um, and it has to be signed by a provider, physician. Uh, the last time we updated this form, it was when uh, APRN became uh, signatory uh, on this. And now uh, this Pulse 3.0 is because physician assistants uh, become signatory. And they have to be licensed in Hawaii. And 327K does stipulate that they have to have examined the patient. So just to remind you real quickly what the post sections are, section A uh, is real simple. That's when the person has no pulse and is not breathing. Um, and that's basically do CPR or don't CPR. A reminder, another common error we find with the pulse, if you want CPR, you got to choose full treatment in section B. There's no such thing as doing CPR and comfort measures or doing CPR and doing a uh, limited or selective treatment. Okay. And that's why it says there right on the form, full treatment is required. Okay, and then not doing CPR, that's allowing a natural death. And that section really is only in effect when there's no pulse and no respirations. So section B, that's um, the patient has a pulse or is breathing. For me, the full treatment, the shorthand for that is, yeah, I'll go back to the hospital and, I, and I'll take the life support and the ICU, uh, everything's on the table. Selective treatment, which is the new term, by the way, on the old form, it was called limited. That's one of the language changes is selective treatment. Yes, I'll go back to the hospital, but I really don't want to be on life support and I would like to avoid the intensive care unit. And comfort focused treatment, and that's a language change instead of comfort measures only, it's comfort focused treatment. Um, comfort really is my priority. Keep me comfortable and I'd rather not go back to the hospital unless that's the only place you think you can get me comfortable. So I, that's my simple, simplified way that sort of Ken, I think, explained it to me about thinking about those three. The sites of care kind of is, is how I think about it. So when do we think is the right time to have these discussions? Well, the, lots of different times, but we certainly think about, you know, at, at a provider visit, um, you know, with, with the doctor, with the APRN, with the PA, um, in, in, in the hospital at time of discharge, that's a quality measure my team has made. If we have a patient who has a code status other than full, we have made it a quality measure that we want to have a discussion with them about what they would like their code status to be when they return to the community. When someone's in the hospital and has a code status that's not full support, do not resuscitate some version of that. I don't know that it's universally understood by the population that when people are discharged, they go back to being full code automatically. And every time they come back to the hospital, the it doesn't default to their last code status. I think a, a reasonable person might think, well, I had that long discussion, I'm DNR, no vent, but I uh, will take other treatments. At least they know that next time I go back to Queens. But of course, that's that's not fair because we really have to have that conversation fresh because things might have changed. So that's one important part about the pulse. We don't want to assume uh, if someone's going back to the community that they want their code status to be what it last was. So it's a conversation about what they would want. Um, and and uh, so time of discharge is important. And a lot of people might do it in nursing home at time of admission, but just a reminder, it's not a requirement. POST is a completely voluntary document. You can never require anybody to do a POST, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a reasonable thing to perhaps consider at the time of nursing home admission. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the uh, old and the new, okay? Um, for, for each of these slides, I put the old version in the white and the new version in the green. And just to show you that we've added some language. Unfortunately, we did have to lose our beautiful logo up there because we needed the space. Um, but we added some new language to explain, again, to clarify, it's not an advanced directive. POLST is a medical order. It's not an advanced directive and it's not intended to replace that document. So that's some new language that's on the POLST. Section B, um, I think I've told you already that we've made some language changes. Full treatment stays the same, but limited additional interventions has been changed to perhaps the more positive selective treatment. And comfort measures only has been changed to comfort focused treatment. But very importantly, we also changed the order. 
Um, that's something that we took from colleagues on the mainland. A lot of just psychometrically, you know, sometimes people tend to default to the first choice that's offered them. Um, so we did not want people just defaulting to comfort measures because that's the first thing that's offered. So full treatment is now the, the first thing that's offered. Some slight language changes, and, and you'll see we have some bolded text there just to try to make it a little clearer. Full treatment primary goal of prolonging life by all medically effective means. In addition to treatment described in selective treatment and comfort focused treatment, use intubation, advanced airway interventions, mechanical ventilations, and cardioversion as indicated includes intensive care as needed. Okay, Selective treatment, goal of treating medical conditions and restoring function while avoiding intensive care and resuscitation. Trying to really clarify the difference between those two. In addition to treatment described in comfort-focused treatment, use medical treatment. IV antibiotics and IV fluids, as indicated, do not intubate. May use non-invasive respiratory support. And then comfort-focused treatment, primary goal of maximizing comfort. Relieve pain and suffering with medication by any route as needed. Use oxygen, suctioning, and manual treatment of airway obstruction. Do not use treatments listed in full and selective treatment unless consistent with comfort goal. Request transfer to hospital only if comfort needs cannot be met in the current location. So again, just try to make that language a little clearer for people to interpret. And again, uh, some changes in, the, in the, the terminology and the order. Section C, I just put it in here for inclusiveness. We made no changes there. Section D, very slight change. All we did was we prioritized uh, the, the the patient and the provider. So the, the I'm sorry, the patient and the legally authorized representative signature comes first now, and the provider signature comes down at the bottom. And of course, critically adding in uh, physician assistants uh, as the signatory options. An update on the back of the form now. A couple of updates. So uh, gender, we have now left it so that people could self-describe their gender. We're not forcing people to, to a binary choice of male, female. Um, because of that confusion uh, about uh, can you use the polls to name your legally authorized representative, which you cannot, that's what that X is there for. We took that right off the form. You can see down at the bottom, and it only says that that's now the emergency contact. Um, we also removed the address. I've always said I don't think we're sending too many telegrams from the emergency department. We really want to have their phone number. Um, and so we replaced address with a relationship with a patient. A lot of people thought that would be a more helpful thing uh, to have there. Um, and then the final real change is also on the back under the instructions, just to remind people that the most recently completed valid post form supersedes all previously completed post forms, and this form does not expire. So those are the changes. And I thank you for your time and attention. I'm going to hand over.